I want to thank Ezra for um, uh, helping with the technology behind the scenes for this session, and he'll admit more people as they arrive in the waiting room. And I in particular want to welcome Roy Yakov Glassman, AM, who is uh, joining us for this conversation over the next hour or so. Uh, I really want to start with uh, actually three points of congratulations for him. First of all, receiving the AM in the recent honours list for his services to the rabbinates and the Jewish community in Australia. Um, second, 10 years as the rabbi of the St Kilda Hebrew congregation, and also 150 years of that congregation's uh, existence, which has, I know, been particularly thriving over his time as the rabbi. Um, he is the rabbi of St Kilda and also the president of the Rabbinical Association of Australasia. When we uh, arranged this uh, session, a little while ago, um, Melbourne was not in lockdown, but Sydney was. And the idea was for um, my Melbourne colleague to give some insights from a more fortunate situation about how we might be coping better in Sydney. Now I have to commiserate with him that we're both at least uh, technically in the same situation, although I hope um, the outlook is, is better in Melbourne, it's looking here in Sydney. Um, but I want to thank in particular, this is a busy time for rabbis, um, uh, dealing with the, the challenges of leading community without the normal uh, means of, uh, of in-person communication and meeting. So I'm very grateful for him for being with us. Um, and uh, maybe we'll just begin, uh, I'll begin with a, the opening question. And if Ryan Lassen wants to give some more background of himself, that's great as well. But essentially Melbourne has been through this a lot more than Sydney. In Sydney, we had one uh, lockdown when the pandemic first uh, arrived. Uh, and then since then, it's been openness of, of greater, to a greater or lesser extent. Whereas Melbourne had a very, very difficult time around this time last year, 111 days um, in lockdown. Um, what advice and what insights and experience do you have to share with us about how we can enter into a period of, of lockdown and uncertainty uh, and all the challenges that brings? Um, I, I guess first and foremost, the important thing is to be cognizant of the reality that um, it really is not something that we can sugarcoat. This is not something that we can sugarcoat. This is something that is affecting the entire nation. It's affecting all of us. Um, it, you know, I've described it almost like a wave. You know, it comes across an entire state and every single person is on the waterbed and we're all affected by the wave somehow, each person in their different way. Um, I think you know, the, in addition to the actual health aspect, the health issues, so I just want to give it a pretext before I give some uh, advice or some, um, some pointers with regard to how to best manage, manage it and cope with it. Um, in addition to the actual health risk associated with catching COVID-19, particularly among people who are immunocompromised or people who are um, in the older demographic and so on, there are a myriad of other issues that, um, that the lockdown itself causes, as we well know, um, it, in, including within the health area, not just financially in terms of the closure of business, particularly small business who don't have massive capital and investments to be able to fall back on as a cushioning. Even in the health area, I was just talking on the phone to one of my uh, Shul members just before I logged on here, who's a GP, and she was telling me that the, the number of people who are missing diagnoses who should have been diagnosed with various illnesses, you know, weeks and weeks uh, ago, are they're not coming out of their shell, um, particularly during lockdown, but even not in lockdown, people are scared. They're scared because they don't want to expose themselves, they're staying indoors and so on and so forth. And I think that a lot of the, the vicarious um, problems that are caused health-wise with regard to, um, to, you know, not seeing our GPs regularly, not getting the tests that we're supposed to get and so on, um, in, in her mind, at least, and in the minds of many doctors that, uh, that have spoken about this in the media and elsewhere, um, can actually be worse than the threat of COVID-19 itself. Um, but the reality is that the COVID, you know, the, the, the current variant in particular, the Delta one, as I don't need to explain to people in New South Wales, is spreading extremely quickly. Um, and, and therefore, lockdown appears to be really the only option. So the question for us, I suppose, is, when we're in those lockdowns, how do we address it? How do we respond to it? Um, and uh, because everyone is affected differently, I think everyone's gonna respond differently or should respond uh, differently. And um, I think probably the most difficult challenge 
uh, within lockdown is the, the loneliness and the isolation that it causes among people who don't have a network or aren't living within uh, like a nucleus family where they've got a family around them and they've got people to talk to. Human beings are natural social beings. Uh, that's who we are. It's, it's you know, symptomatic of the human condition to want to connect to other people. And um, even, you know, self-described introverts are also people who want to connect with others on some level. And when that opportunity is, is taken from us uh, or denied to us, um, we, we need to be very mindful of the psychological and emotional impact that's going to have. So I guess the first and foremost um, lesson that I learned during lockdown was the importance of reaching out, the importance of connecting with people through technology when we feel the need. Um, equally important um, is to reach out to others if we sense that they might feel the need, but for whatever reason might be too shy or too unwilling to reach out, just to continuously, you know, I was receiving various text messages from random people, members of my congregation and others. Hi, Yaakov, are you okay thinking about you at this time? If you want to talk, let's chat. And that was very heartening, particularly as my role as a pastoral carer is to be is to try and be there for others. Um, so certainly at the St Kilda Shul, what we did, um, you know, once we saw that the lockdown was going to take a very, very long time, you know, we were seeing 700 cases a day before uh, the Victorian Premier announced the, the lockdown that lasted 111 days, was we divided up our entire membership list of about 1,500 people and families, and um, every board member uh, took a, a number of those uh, names, as well as the rabbinical team, and we just made a wave of phone call. We just kept phoning people throughout a couple of weeks until every single one of our members was reached. And I think, uh, Rabbi Elton, that is the first and foremost thing to, to try and ensure that people who are suffering in silence, who are lonely, um, are reached out to and are made to feel that there are that there is someone with them, um, you know, on the other on the other side. Um, uh, thanks very much for that. And um, how is your community affected in the long run? Um, in terms of uh, people's connection with each other and with you and the and the shul team, in terms of uh, energy and and attendance at uh, services and other events, um, I think before lockdown, the second lockdown here, we were beginning to see uh, a, a return to pre-COVID levels, but there was still a shortfall between what we'd left behind and and how we were resuming. Um, was it a double whammy for you or? Um, uh, what's recovery been like? It's an interesting question. I think that because Victoria has been in and out of five lockdowns, we're currently on lockdown 5.0, um, we've become quite used to it. And we transition quite well from lockdown to no lockdown, lockdown to no lockdown. Our systems are in place. Our congregants well understand the systems. They well understand the pre-registration requirements. So when we're in lockdown, they know you know, we've simplified it by making all of our online experiences at the one address, the one Zoom account, and they just log on and off, on and off. I can see congregants from my shul on this Zoom call itself. Um, and, it, and and as a result, it, it, it you know, we, we really hit the ground running um, when the, the major lockdown hit us. Um, and our Chazan Brett K was, you know, just incredible, just built an army of followers uh, doing his you know, pre-Shabbat Friday night, Kabbalat Shabbats, getting people from all around the world, from South Africa, from Israel. And, you know, by the time he posted on, on all the different Facebook groups, uh, you know, he was amassing thousands of views on a weekly basis, which was incredible. And that connected people through song. So in that sense, our audience and our attendance was actually higher during lockdown than it was uh, pre-lockdown. Um, but of course, when we transition out of lockdown back to, I guess, real life, so to speak, or, yeah. you know, physical uh, attendances, um, the, the congregation well understands the pre-registration requirements. So we did find that shul was picking up in attendance quite well, I have to say, because for the regulars, um, you know, coming to shul is important for them. And, and as such, they want to be a part of it. And, you know, it's a very, um, you know, it, it, St Kilda Shul has always been a very sort of organized, structured type of place. So people understand that when you want to come to shul, you've got to pre-register and they do it in the beginning of the week. And, our CEO, Rabbi Figdor, uh, you know, um, created email, uh, email um, system where you'd get an automatic email if you attended Shul last week to invite you to re-register for this week and so on it went. So we basically made it easy for people to come. 
and we slowly eased back into it to all our, of our different social and educational events. So in direct answer to your question, Rabbi Elton, I think that um, we found that uh, attendances did remain relatively strong, but there's no doubting that, you know, in the earlier stages of, you know, lockdowns two or three, it was kind of waxing and waning till people got the hang of it. What do you think will be the long-term impacts on, on shuls and on Jewish communities? So we in the Orthodox community don't have the option of uh, being online for Shabbat and Yom Tov themselves. Um, but we do have the option of having shiurim during the week, which are online, uh, and having other events and talks and so on, which are online. And yet, uh, I feel that although in some sense you, you, you might reach, reach a larger audience by going online, uh, if you were to go there entirely, you would miss that very important human contact which you get from turning up uh, to a shul, to a hall, to a venue, and, and all the mixing that happens, you know, before the, the talk starts and during the tea break and so on. Um, I'll, I'll share my concern, and I'd like to hear your response to it, that um, we might be pushed into a state of, uh, of more online events, and we will, we will forget about the advantages brought by in-person events, even if sometimes they get a, a smaller crowd than you might get on Facebook or on Zoom. Um, look, Rabbi Alton, I think you make a very good point. Um, I suspect, however, that human nature has not changed since the dawn of civilization. And central to the need within human nature is human companionship, is the, is the need to connect with other human beings. You know, the, the, the art of human altruism and the warmth of the human embrace, these things will never um, be lost to who we are inherently. I think it's in our DNA. So whilst I agree with you that lockdown and the, you know, the proliferation of online events all around the world has given us access to a much wider pool of both audiences as well as speakers and presenters. Um, nevertheless, I think that after all said and done, people are going to pine once it's safe to do so, once we get past this COVID and please God, you know, majority vaccinations and so on. Um, I think people are going to pine to get back to the human inter uh, uh, interactions. I mean, I vividly recall um, after we had our double donut figures in Victoria and, um, you know, the Premier basically announced we can go back to semi-normal living, I had to drive down Chapel Street, which is sort of a, a, a bit of a, uh, I don't know how to refer to it, a, a sort of a, a hippie area, let's call it, um, and tons of cafes and restaurants. When I drove past there, the first night that restaurants were allowed to be open, it was absolutely jam-packed absolutely jam-packed you could not people were spilling out onto the streets um it was on for young and old and i think people were so desperate just to get back to that human interaction that um they just gravitated to it to, to it back to it like fish in water so i don't necessarily think that in the long term um you know that this kind of online hub is going to remain a bubble i think we're going to expand out of it and i think people are going to get back to the connections because that is what the heart of the human desires and, and what it needs. Um, it, even, even within families itself, you know, nucleus families within a larger family, connecting with extended family and so on, these things are never going to go away. And I think that we are going to, um, you know, adapt straight back into it um, once, once it becomes safe to do so. I was interested in what you said, uh, that people are now used to, um, there's, there's lockdown drill and there's, uh, and there's uh, semi-open drill. And eventually there'll be a return to, please God, completely open. Um, I suppose there's two different responses a person can go through to the in-out, in-out. One is a repeated sense of deflation as another lockdown comes around the corner. And another yeah. is a sort of a battle-hardened, well, we know what we're doing. We'll just sort of brace ourselves, grit our teeth, and we'll get through this like we've got through the last ones. And then we'll, we'll return. So sort of like in the Second World War, every time there's an air raid, people couldn't feel totally despondent. They, they knew this was a fact of life and life was punctuated by these moments of, of difficulty or, or danger and they had to get through it. I think at the moment, New South Wales is feeling deflated that having been through one lockdown and then remained open since then, the second one has been a big kick in the guts. Um, from, the, from Melbourne's experience, do you see that turning around into a more of a, a getting used to the, the ebb and flow 
Uh, yeah, I think that's a very fair description. Um, and I would probably agree with you. I don't know whether we can read much into the different responses um, from Victoria and New South Wales to very long lockdowns. Um, Victoria, were there were riots, there were protests, but by and large, the vast majority of people were quite compliant uh, and sheep-like, dare I say it, and quite obedient. I don't know um, the situation in New South Wales, whether whether it's, you know, whether people are by and large following the rules. Um, but I do agree with you that, you know, if, uh, that, that um, we have become quite, we've just become used to it. We accept it almost as a part of life, that there is a possibility for lockdown. I actually think that because our second lockdown lasted for so long and it was so traumatizing, as I said, we're not going to sugarcoat that. It was, it was horrific. I think that because of that, that gave Victorians a strong sense that when the Premier announces a snap lockdown, a short lockdown of five days or the current one we're in 12 days, it gave people a greater sense of almost wanting to just get it over and done with, you know, because you can't fight City Hall. So you have two options. You can either go into lockdown early, hit it early and, and hopefully be out in a couple of weeks, or you can let it spread and then eventuate yourself, eventually be in a lockdown that's going to last for weeks and weeks and months. So I think Victorians kind of accept it as a fate, almost, that if it's going to happen anyway, let's just have a two-week one instead. And again, that's not to say that there aren't significant numbers of people who strongly disagree with lockdowns, fundamentally disagree, and who, who don't want to see the continuous closure of small business and, 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 and mental health issues and so on and so forth. There are some who say that the lockdowns are causing more damage than, than just letting it rip. And that's a medical uh, conversation. Um, but but in terms of the community, um, I do think that, um, you know, everyone knows you can't fight City Hall. And if the government makes an announcement, there's no point in complaining about it. So the best thing to do is the best of the bad lot of options is just to embrace a shorter lockdown and just get on with it. I think that's the way Victorians have become conditioned. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you about your personal experience last year? What was it like as a as a Jew and as a committed observant Jew and as a rabbi, having Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur um, at home? It was so eerie. Um, it was the first time in Victorian Jewry's history that shuls were closed since Jews moved to Victoria uh, and since shuls began operating. Um, and um, I have to say that personally, it was challenging in the sense that, you know, the high holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are the, are the time to connect to your congregation. It's the time where, you know, you'll have the vast majority of your members in shul um, and being able to engage with them and talk to them and having them see you and so on. And I've actually felt feedback from the congregants and from our members that they genuinely missed that high holiday experience. So on a personal note, uh, in terms of my rabbinic life, it was tough. Um, the, the notion for myself of being at home on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I, I joked with my congregation that on, you know, first day Rosh Hashanah at about 11 a.m., uh, I started to develop an itch. And it was an itch to give a sermon because, of course, <laughs> us rabbis, we like giving sermons. Um, and so I turned to my kids and I said, kids, do you want to hear a sermon? And they said, no, that's all right, Dad. You can keep that to yourself. I turned to the Rebbets and I said, Rebbets, do you want to hear a sermon? She said, Yaakov, appreciate the offer, but I've heard plenty of your sermons. So I went out onto the street for my half an hour or hour of allocated exercise time. And lo and behold, I saw one of our congregants across the road walking his dog. And I yelled out, we exchanged niceties. And I said, would you like to hear a sermon? Obviously in jest. And he sort of hurry, uh, you know, hurriedly moved towards the corner and out of sight. So I guess the notion of um, the rabbi, as a rabbi, feeling um, the need to offer religious services on the high holidays and just sitting there in your house not delivering those services kind of makes you feel a little bit useless in a sense and then you kind of and then I sort of um, just accepted that that's the reality and began to say well you know one of the things that as a rabbi I've often lamented pre-COVID is that during the holiest holiest days of the year Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur I'm so preoccupied with catering for uh, you know, for my congregation and oscillating between the main shul service and the parallel service in the main hall and back and forth and all over the place. When do I get a, a time to actually meditate and pray, um, you know, properly? 
And this was almost God's way of saying, well, here you go. You've, you've, you've wanted it. You've pined for it, for it. There's no one else to talk to but me. And that, that sort of empowered me to be able to connect spiritually in a way that I hadn't done before uh, during those awesome days. Just practically and um, thinking about uh, the possibilities this coming year, just practically the, the challenges of, let's say, Yom Kippur, of fasting, of uh, children being at home, um, of uh, trying to keep the house in one piece with no option of childcare, uh, that, that presents very real practical challenges for, for religious um, uh, introspection as well as, uh, uh, as well as just getting through the day. Yeah, it, absolutely. And I think it became it became a bit of a, um, a juggling act, really. Um, it's, it really is important to point out here that that we need to be mindful of the reality that whilst some families will report saying it's there's a lot of family time and it's good to connect, you know, and so on. There are some families which are severely dysfunctional and there are some families in which abuse is occurring on any number of levels. Uh, or neglect or a level of toxicity if things aren't quite right between mum and dad or whatever it might be. And I think that environment becomes, um, whether you're in a religious home or not, becomes exceedingly challenging. And it is important to be mindful of that. I have no doubt that, you know, domestic violence has been skyrocketing during lockdowns because, it, you know, when, when you've got a perpetrator and a victim in the same space locked up together for so long and no one to turn to and so on, I think it just exacerbates um, the challenges over there. So I do preface my words by acknowledging that reality. But for families which are functional and are cohesive and are loving and caring and nurturing environments, one kind of needs to try and see as best as possible the silver lining. And what I, what I mean to say is that no one would desire lockdown. No one wants COVID. But once we are here, is there a way to try and see the positive as best as possible to see the positives within the negative. And I think one of the positives um, within the family is that we live in such a distracted world with so many different, um, you know, distractions online and, and, and so many things, you know, uh, fighting for our and competing for our attention. When we are in lockdown, particularly on Shabbat and festivals, uh, for those who are religiously observant and switch off all of their technology, you know, you've got that day in the week, Shabbat, or those days in, during the festivals and the Chagim, which become like an island, an island of connection. So certainly in our home, the way we managed it is we, we wanted to create structure. So I said to my kids, you know, morning service on Shabbat is going to be 10 o'clock. You're not all going to pray in your rooms. We're doing it together as a family. So everyone would convene as a family. I let them sleep in a little bit till nine or whatever. And then after the service, which we'd all lead different parts of it. And of course, because there's no minyan, we could have the boys and the girls or one family together and everyone had a part. And then we would have a structured time for lunch. And then we would go out for, you know, in pairs for a walk uh, in the afternoon for our hour of exercise or half an hour or whatever it was. And just try to create that routine where there's family time, there's prayer time, a bit of study time, a bit of, uh, you know, relaxation time, each to their own reading and so on. So I think that structure helped. Um, and I think that the, the, framework provided by the strictures of Jewish law allowed for that because there were no technology. Um, what I wouldn't want to see is a situation where my kids are just on their devices, because I do have uh, teenage kids on their devices 24-7 locked up in their room. I don't think that that's a, a healthy situation. Uh, I want to open the floor to anyone who's on the call to ask the question of Roy Glassman, uh, any of the uh, Sydney people watching. And uh, if any of the um, Melbournians want to ask me a question, that also be uh, also be happy to hear. Um, I think um, I will um, put on, open up the chat function. So people can either um, put up a, a note in the chat or if they just uh, um, put their hand up, uh, I think Ezra will unmute them and, uh, and, they can, and they can ask the question just orally. So uh, please, any questions at all? Right, that's when I'm very, very keen to answer anything you have. Hi, uh, Rabbi Glassman, I have a, a question. How have the, the youth in your community, the teenagers and, and the younger children, how, how have they handled your long lockdowns? Uh, 
Um, they connect anyway through social media. They connect anyway through their gadgets. And I think that there's, I've noticed and sensed a great sense of um, communal, of, of, of almost social responsibility and people sharing in each other's burdens and looking out for each other and creating chat groups for each other and so on. Um, and I think the reason for that is because young people are often more prone and more at risk to mental health issues and, and uh, issues of depression stemming from isolation and loneliness. So I have seen an emergence of that care aspect. Um, at the same time, um, uh, at the same time, I think, you know, I'd, I'd be I'd be misleading if I didn't point out um, the the challenges that young people do have. I think that they were really really struggling during that time, even with all of the, you know, the the social co the social um, responsibility uh, with each other. I think that they were struggling, um, and I know that I had quite a few. Um, discussions over several days with some young members of my congregation who were doing it tough just to just to be a support for them and i think that they really appreciated it um, at the time so um yeah so in answer to your question i think young people are more vulnerable in that regard that's not to suggest that other age brackets are not but young people tend to be more socially active anyway and therefore the absence of that social interaction probably hit them harder Uh, another question from either Sydney or Melbourne. Rabbi Elton, while people uh, formulate their thoughts as to a question, I did want to, uh, I said it earlier, just to acknowledge, um, you know, I'm following you on Facebook, and I think that you and your rabbinic team and your board are doing a great job um, in engaging with the members of the Great Synagogue. So, kola kavod to you for that. Um, and also, thanks for your earlier uh, accolades. I, I can't claim any um, input or responsibility to the Shul 150th. Uh, that happened well before I got there, that the inception of that. Um, it's a big year for us. We keep postponing our gala event. We've got the governor of Victoria as our keynote. Um, but as all of the members of the congregation remind me, they say, Yaakov, you're still a bit of a pisher. <laughs> you know, you're still quite young. You've only been here for 10 years. It's a big time in your world, but in our world, uh, you know, you've got families who have been here intergenerationally since the 1870s. So um, uh, I won't take any credit for the Shul's 150th. What I think has been a difference, and I think you alluded to this, is, um, is the speed at which you can pivot. So I think the for, for our lockdown number one last year, um, we um, were working out really on the fly what to do and and uh, by the time this lockdown came along we had a, already had an idea of what worked and what didn't work what people liked and what people were less uh, enthused about so we actually moved much more, more quickly and more efficiently and effectively to um to do what we needed to do so again our rabbinic team and uh, board members had divided up the the membership uh, and everyone's getting a call uh, over the over the weeks of the lockdown um and then events such as these uh, which have uh, which have attracted you know people audience interestingly enough both in the middle of the day and also at the end of the day for for different groups or people who have different uh, preferences i i joked um last year after high holidays you know if i ever have to do a series of high holidays during a, a pandemic then i'll know what to do but of course i won't need that experience anymore because this will be a a once in a lifetime once in a career a necessity well um i'm having to draw draw back and trying to recall the lessons that the lessons that were there to learn from last year's high holidays to apply them for planning uh, for this year stuff which i'd hope to i'd hope to forget yeah absolutely yeah do we have more questions i think carmel carmel's a, a long-standing member of the st kilda shul hi carmel thank you for joining us hi rabbi Elton. i'd just like to say that um it, it's not a question, but I was one of the people that rang around the congregants last year um, during lockdown. And I must say it was a wonderful idea. There was people were so thrilled, they were so surprised that we'd gone to the trouble of organizing this ring around that it was just a great idea. I'd just like to let you know that it was really um, so well accepted by all our congregants. 
Mm-hmm. Yes, that's the experience we've had as well in Sydney when when uh, somebody gets a call just checking how they are in these difficult circumstances. Um, they always respond um, uh, very warmly to that to that uh, approach. Um, I think people people do appreciate taking time out to see how they're doing. Uh, just as as Roy Glassman said, when somebody calls um, the rabbi or the president of the shul and finds out how they're doing, it also has a a, a very big effect. It makes you uh, makes you feel very very happy that somebody is thinking about you and and uh, and looking out for you. Absolutely, and our rabbi is an expert at doing that. Birthdays and all other occasions, he's on the phone. That's wonderful. Rabbi Glassman, are you an extrovert? <laughs> you know what? It's a very good question. I, I don't actually know um, because um, when I get some downtime, which is not all that common, I tend to spend it to myself uh, or with myself. And I don't know whether it's because, um, because I'm naturally introverted or because I'm extrovert, but I spend so much of my day and my week and my year engaging with people that I sort of exhaust that quota in a sense. And then when I have that spare time, tend to become a little bit quieter. So I don't actually, I've forgotten what I am, to be honest, Rabbi Elton, naturally. Uh, but I suspect naturally a little bit more uh, introvert. Um, but just being in public positions and public roles demands um, a lot of external activity. And I'm always very happy to engage um, in that world. I mean, speaking of a, of a shul of 150 years um, existence, uh, and coming in, as, as we all do, anyone who comes into a into a position in a very long-standing organisation or congregation um, faces similar challenges. So I arrived in 2015 at the Great Synagogue, uh, which was 137 years after it was begun. You arrived 140 years after St Kilda uh, started. Um, I, I'd have my own reflections, but um, do you have any reflections on what it's like um, joining not only as a, as a part of it, as the leader of a very long-standing institution um, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a new guy? Um, certainly, certainly. I think that the most important thing from my perspective at that time was to recognise that you, you can't make an impact on the present and certainly not influence the future unless you understand the past. Um, St Kilda has a very long tradition. It's a very distinctive congregation. It's got a particular culture and it's operated within a particular milieu. And so the first thing I did was really try to understand the history of the congregation. I read up on it. I engaged in a lot of conversation with a lot of the members of the congregation who have been around for decades and uh, was, uh, was able to sort of get a strong sense of who we are as a congregation and try not to make any radical changes uh, until I had a really good footing and an understanding of that. Um, and thereafter, you know, the, the focus has always been on trying to blend tradition and modernity. Um, because, you know, a place like St Kilda Shul, and I suspect the Great Synagogue would be very similar, does have strong traditional roots and have certain ways of doing things. Um, but at the same time, we're living in 2021 and the world is changing rapidly and is changing faster than it has, ever has in, in the decades preceding. Uh, and we need to adapt to those changes because if we don't, then we become uh, irrelevant and obsolete. We need to um, try and tread the, the you know, the tightrope. Of, into, of, of synthesizing and marrying together adaptability to the present, to the modern, to the contemporary issues of the world, whilst maintaining that sense of tradition. So I think that that was the, at the forefront of my mind when joining uh, the congregation and uh, continue to try and do that um, as well today. It was suggested to me, I think very uh, insightfully by a rabbinic colleague that um, the way to look about COVID, look at COVID might not necessarily be a time of um, change with a time of catalyst. In other words, a catalyst makes changes happen more quickly, but they don't necessarily initiate the changes themselves. Mm-hmm. So certain major events in uh, modern history, the First World War, the Second World War, um, the Holocaust, of course, um, the immigration into Australia in the, in the 50s from, from um, Europe and from, uh, from, from Great Britain, um, these, uh, in some cases initiated changes, but more often they made changes happen more quickly that were already in seas and would have developed over slowly over a long period. But, uh, but the, the major event caused everything to, to become much more rapid. Um, have you any thoughts about, about COVID as a catalyst? 
Um, I think I personally think it's still too early to tell uh, because countries all around the world have been solely preoccupied preoccupied with dealing with COVID, uh, and and that has stripped them of the opportunity to to think long term and be strategic and so on. I don't think that we're seeing any major shifts emerging. I think it will be interesting to see once COVID does, please God, die down, hopefully in the not too distant future, once we do have the majority vaccinations, hopefully, and so on, and lockdowns are a thing of the past and we get back to semi-normal, it'll be very interesting to see um, whether the society, whether the Australian society or the international community um, changes significantly. Um, I, I suspect um, that by and large it won't change. I think we're going to go back to how things were in terms of the connectivity. I think one of the things that will change for, for good now are um, uh, meetings, um, you know, through technology. I think that people see the benefits of saving time, of meeting through Zoom and whatever it is. You know, why would someone travel to Sydney from Melbourne for a one, you know, for a two hour meeting, even if it's a high level meeting, only then travel back. So you, you leave the house at 7 a.m., you get back at 7 p.m. Um, you've missed, you, you've lost your whole day for a two hour meeting when you could just as well uh, be at that meeting online. I think that, see, I think in the business corporate world, those things will change just for practical purposes. But by and large, I don't, I haven't seen, uh, I wouldn't predict that COVID is a catalyst for any major changes, um, to be honest. Both, both religiously and uh, more widely. Yeah, I, I don't see it uh, uh, changing that much. In other words, uh, even even religiously, it's actually interesting you mentioned that. Colleagues of mine from the more religious shuls uh, told me that in some instances, not all instances, but some, uh, it's actually more of a drop-off from shul attendance within the religious community than in a place like St Kilda Shul, which I find fascinating um, because people have gotten quite used to the notion of just praying at home and not having to bother with coming to the minyan. And also because going to shul was such a daily not once, not twice, but thrice uh, in those communities, the need to have to pre-register becomes a bit of a pain uh, and therefore people just don't do it. And then it comes to the service or the, sh the Shabbat morning and they say, oh, well, I haven't registered, so I'll just stay home. And that becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy and a vicious cycle. So if anything, I think it perhaps, you know, on the religious side of things, it might affect the religious communities more, but a place like St Kilda Shul, which is kind of a, a centrist ground, um, I, I've noticed that in between lockdowns, the attendances have sprung back quite relatively strongly. And I suspect that, you know, after the last lockdown, whenever it will be, you know, I think that the people who enjoyed the regular interactions with the shul, the regular services, the religious interactions, the social interactions, I think people are just going to spring straight back to how it was. That's, that's what my gut tells me. So I, I don't see any seismic changes. Speaking to colleagues in England who also um, arise of shuls where almost everyone is Shema Shabbat and would be davening three times a day, whether in shul or at home. Uh, so that what you said um, resonates very strongly. I, I think um, maybe places like St Kilda and also the Great Synagogue, um, they're, they're, they're shul going, attending shul uh, has a status distinct from davening, um, uh, not in a good way or a bad way. Uh, but yeah. uh, it's different. So if you're yeah. a very religious person, you say, well, I'll, I'll, I can daven chakras here, I can daven chakras there. Yes, it's a value to me to be in a minion, to have um, Kedusha, to have Kaddish, if I'm saying Kaddish. But fundamentally, I can fulfill what I need to fulfill um, uh, by davening at home. Maybe not Torah reading, but if you're willing to overlook that, then you say, well, I davened anyway, so what difference? Whereas yeah. if your religious experience is defined by being in a shul and being part of a shul service, then it's much more important to attend. Yeah, I, th I think I agree with that entirely. Um, I, I would like to pick up on one thing, Rabbi Elton, just going back to the, the point of the interpersonal um, relationships that we have and the notion of looking out for other people. I believe that if anything, if anything has emerged from COVID lockdowns in particular, it's the need to become more sensitive to other people. Um, you know, we can make the mistake of, you know, just becoming quite self-absorbed, not necessarily in a selfish way, but just because we become preoccupied with the worries of, you know, how do I fend for myself? How do I fend for my family? How do we get through this and so on? That we can sometimes drop our guard in relation to how other people might be traveling. Um, and I cannot 
emphasize how important it is to be reaching out to other people. Even if you just have a suspicion, I, I would rather receive 10 text messages from family or friends asking if, if I'm okay when I am okay, um, than not receiving them um, when I'm not okay. In other words, we don't want to take um, that risk or that chance. And I think that there are a lot of people who suffer in silence. I think that people become experts in wearing a mask and just trying to deflect what's going on inside. Um, so I think that it would be helpful um, if nothing else were to emerge from this dialogue for, for each of us, myself included, just have another think about who are the people around me, look through your phone contacts, look through your Facebook friends and, and just think, who have I not heard from in a while? Who have I not engaged with for quite some time? Who have I not seen active in, 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 you know, in some weeks or whatever it is? And just try to reach out. You know, the worst case scenario is, or best case scenario, dare I say it, is I'm, I'm doing great, but really appreciate your call. Um, there, there's a very powerful story uh, that I'm reminded of that occurred to Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl, of course, needs little introduction. He, you know, he was the master of logotherapy, and he, he was one of three Viennese um, psychotherapists. He was preceded by uh, Nietzsche and Freud, of course, but he had a very revolutionary way of thinking, um, because you know, whereas Nietzsche and Freud were very focused on, on the self on you know, the will to power and the will to pleasure, he was all about finding meaning, the will to meaning, finding meaning in life, even in the darkest places. And he, of course, suffered um, in the concentration camps in Dachau and Auschwitz for three years. And he emerged, he survived the war, thank, thank God. And he recounted the story, a powerful, powerful story, uh, which I've told once before to my congregation about he was about to go to sleep one evening. It was quite late at night and the phone rang um, and he answered the phone and there was a, a lady on the other end of the phone who was extremely distraught um, and really in a bad place. And she had called him in total desperation and actually communicated to him on the phone that she had had enough in life and intended to end her life that night. You could imagine how Frankel responded to that. So he, you know, he was a, psychotherapist par excellence and he stayed on the phone with her for hours well into the wee hours of the morning and he talked to her and communicated with her and effectively shared with her reason after reason why it is important to continue living to try and see the transience of the darkness that there is a light at the end of the tunnel that the way we feel today does not define the way we're going to feel in a few days from now or in some weeks from now and just to see that there that there is a possible brighter place uh, at the other end and um at, at the end of the conversation this lady uh, reneged on her initial um threat so to speak and she said she was not going to self-harm and she didn't she was true to her word and frankel asked if they could meet up in person um, a few days later and she acquiesced and they met up and in the conversation the face-to-face -face conversation victor frankel asked her you know, if we, she, he said, if we can go back to that night that you phoned me, you know, after he'd established that she was in a better place, thankfully, he said, if we can go back to that night when you were in a, in a dark place, he was curious. He said, which of the reasons that I shared with you about why it's important to, to continue living was the one that finally persuaded you? And her response was fascinating. She said, quite frankly, none of them. It wasn't what you said to me that night that gave me the strength to continue. It's simply the fact that you stayed on the phone with me to say it. In other words, the fact that you stayed on the phone with me for hours into a time that you were supposed to be asleep and you shared my burden and you were with me on the other end of the phone, that itself is what kind of sparked my, my desire to, con to continue living and to try and fight the demons and so on and so forth. So I think that that, that a dialogue and that encounter uh, to me is an incredibly powerful story. It's not about what we say when we're on the phone or finding the magic words or finding the right formula. It's about the act of caring. It's about showing another human being that you actually care about their well-being and their, their existence. And I would even add that when we do reach out to other people and sense from them that they are appreciative of your call or your text message or whatever it is, 
it does create a greater sense of self and a great sense of fulfillment. And, and a, you know, I'm sure uh, Carmel, who mentioned earlier, she was wonderful in volunteering to call um, several people on our membership list. It feels good when people feed back to you to say, thank you for reaching out. You know, you've made my day and so on and so forth. So I think it's a win-win situation if we just try to do that um, and, and just to be mindful of the sensitivities of, of other people. So it's about care, I think. That's uh, a beautiful and important insight. I think we have a question from Steve Schach. Yeah, th thank you, Rabbi Elton. Uh, Rabbi Glassman, uh, when, please God, this epidemic is over, do you see any chain additions to the liturgy? Perhaps an additional bracha, bi'kosh shachar, additional mitzvahera, something added to remind us of, of what happened and pray that it never happens again? Um, it's a very good question. I, I don't think that there will be a change to the actual liturgy for the simple reason that, um, just a technical reason that the rabbis of today, as much as we like to think we're, uh, we're, we're um, well-placed, we are not on the same caliber of the rabbis in Mishnaic and Talmudic times. And, um, and therefore to add to the formulae of texts and prayers, which they uh, instituted is, is, is unlikely. I don't think it's warranted, but what I do think is warranted is finding much, much deeper meaning in the existing prayers. Because so much of what, of what you've suggested earlier already exists in our prayers. You know, when we wake up in the morning, every single morning, and we say simple blessings about, you know, thank you for restoring my soul to me. Thank you, God, for, you know, giving me the faculty of vision, of, of, of uh, cohere, you know, of um, a cognitive, you know, coherence, of general health in Rafa'en, or of a basic income in the, in the blessing Baruch Alein, or in the Amidah. The, the blessings actually exist, I think. Uh, the mistake that we can often make is not being mindful of those blessings and just saying them monotonously and in a perfunctory sort of way. So I certainly do um, agree with the premise that, we sh that our prayers should become much more enriched and meaningful um, through this period once the pandemic is gone and, and should never forget it. But I don't think that will actually change the, litur the liturgy in a technical sense. Um, um, but I just hope that we change the way in which we approach prayer and make it more meaningful, more relevant and more personalized uh, in our in our day to day life. So, you know, and I'm talking to myself more so than to anyone else. Thank you, Rabbi. I was very struck uh, on the high holidays last year that some phrases that, that the year before were sort of quaint uh, in a Western context suddenly became frighteningly relevant. When we say in Unasanatokef, me by my gay far, you know, who will be uh, caused to die through plague? Previously, that just seemed um, a throwback to times when, you know, cholera or tuberculosis would rip through a, a community and cause terrible um, devastation. And people lived in real fear of that. And then it just became an opportunity for the Khazan to, uh, uh, to be dramatic on uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And then suddenly last year, there really wasn't a, a magefa. Um, so the the uh, to add to your point, sometimes the circumstances make the old prayers more relevant and not less. It's a great example. Do we have another question or questions? Rabbi Elton, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. I know we're reversing the camera a little bit, but if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Do you find congregants asking you your opinion about the vaccine or about various medical medical uh, issues? Um, I don't give them the chance to ask me my opinion. I give them my opinion. Um, in discussions with the president and the board, um, we were all agreed from our own um, uh, sense and research uh, and, um, and through looking at uh, the advice given by health authorities and, and the government and so on, that we really need to encourage people very strongly to take the vaccine. So in a, in a proactive sense, in, in almost all of our communications with the congregation over this period, even before lockdown, we've been really encouraging people to have the vaccine. We instituted quite a cute um, little initiative in the shul that so we said, if you told the shul when you had your vaccine, then we would give you an honor in the shul to celebrate. 
So for your birthday, your wedding anniversary, your bar or bar mitzvah anniversary, you'll get an honour, but also for your vaccine, let the shul know and uh, men will be called up and we'll be given another honour uh, in order to uh, celebrate your vaccine because we wanted to put our weight behind it as much as possible uh, and to really encourage uh, the congregation. And my sense from the congregation is that people are very pro-vaccine uh, and, um, and people are really seeking to get it as much as they can. And I think the Jewish community in general in Sydney seems to be pretty uh, pro-vaccine because although the numbers of people vaccinated across the whole of Australian society uh, are still um, not as high as we would like by any means, a lot of people in the Jewish community seem to have made a real effort to get themselves vaccinated and certainly responded very positively when they were invited to make a booking. Um, but we just keep, uh, we just keep uh, plucking away uh, and really encouraging as much as we can people to get vaccinated as soon as they can, consistent with fairness to everyone else who's, else who's looking for a vaccine as well. Uh, yeah. What's your experience? Um, yes, I'm, I'm obviously also quite pro-vaccine um, and I've been vaccinated myself, uh, both of them. But uh, I just found it fascinating that there are uh, people, Jewish people, who are phoning their rabbis, because I've received a few of those phone calls uh, in recent weeks. Uh, and it, I find it fascinating that people are phoning their rabbi for that advice, um, because the only response I've ever given uh, to people who ask me, you know, Yaakov or Rabbi, should, should I take the vaccine? As I said, um, it's a very simple conversation. You pick up the phone to your doctor, and you ask them that question and you do exactly as he or she says. And that's the end of the story. And of course, the overwhelming majority of doctors, if not all of them, are very pro-vaccine. Pro but I find it fascinating that there would be this mindset that you kind of have to get your rabbi's advice on a medical issue. Uh, I've spent not a nanosecond of my time in medical school and am grossly ill-equipped to be giving uh, medical advice uh, uh, beyond or contrary to what the existing government medical advice is um, and from all of the medical health uh, experts so it was more a, a, an, an inquiry about um, the the you know the 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 mindset the psychology that some people have that they kind of feel the need to get the rabbis okay or go ahead and I think that the reason why some people have that mindset not not many thankfully is because of a lot of the misinformation that's been put out there on Facebook, you know, and when I posted on Facebook um, that I'd been fully vaccinated and I did so because I wanted to encourage other people to do the same, you know, you, I'd in, invariably get these private messages from a few people that I would refer to as quite, you know, extremists telling me why am I injecting poison into myself? And why am I encouraging other people to do it? It's uh, all that sort of rubbish and that nonsense and the scare campaign. And I think that, when people start trying to use, you know, religious texts or religion to, to mark, you know, to um, enclose their ridiculous um, arguments, um, it kind of creates this sense that that religion or religious leaders would have problems with the vaccine, and that's what concerns me a lot. So. Um, that's why I always tell people, you know, it's a joke that when rabbis become doctors, Judaism becomes sick. So we've got to steer far away and steer clear of uh, blurring the lines. Um, you know, I think halacha is very clear that on all and every medical issue, um, the doctors become the rabbis and we listen to what they say. So um, I, I think you might be I think you might be touching on an interesting cultural difference between Melbourne and Sydney, because. I don't think there's a huge um, cultural difference between St Kilda and uh, and the Greats. We're probably quite similar congregations in many ways, but I think there is a cultural difference in Jewish terms between Melbourne and Sydney. But Sydney is uh, Sydney jury has always been had far fewer extremes. So we have a very 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 small, um, you know, uh, strictly orthodox seg segment, um, and uh, we also have very few people who are in an organised way radically anti-religion and secularist and Yiddishist and Bundist and so on. Um, everyone is kind of traditionalist in the middle, um, ob more observant or less observant, but the extremes are missing. And I think maybe some of those approaches you're getting might be um, informed by chatter coming out of the extremes. Also on the point you make about um, uh, we're not the experts, we also made a, a policy decision from the get-go at the Great Synagogue that we were going to follow government and health advice, both the Khumra and the Kula. 
both yeah. in terms of strictnesses and also in terms of uh, leniencies. So we, once we were given the go-ahead to reopen, we reopened. When we're given the go-ahead to have some sort of kiddush, uh, we did that. We did not impose extra restrictions which the government uh, permitted. We trusted the government and, and their health advisors that only allowed us to do things which were, were safe. Uh, we didn't double-guess them either to be stricter or, 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 or less strict than government advice. And that's been, I think, very important because that means that it isn't the opinion of, of untrained people, either rabbis or board members, um, making the decisions. We say, if the government says we can do this safely, if they're not mm. saying, um, well, you can, but really we don't want you to, if they're saying, no, this is fine to do with these um, um, safeguards in place, then, then, then go ahead. That's what we did. And, yeah. and so far, I think we've, it, it's, it's worked out because, um, in fact, no one in, in Sydney, as far as we know, from the list of uh, published um, exposure sites, no one has ever become sick through attending uh, a synagogue service. Um, yeah. And that's been very heartening. I think, uh, yeah, I am fully, fully agree with you on that. And Astral has taken the same approach. I think it's quite fascinating, though, if you look at in terms of the, the sociological arguments, politicians have never been the most trusted group of people on the face of the planet, if we are honest. Doesn't matter whether it's federal or state. And I think part of the the uh, the pitfalls or the dangers, the risk aspect is that when politicians say, oh, we're following public health advice, you've, you're always gonna have that group of people, um, or maybe it's not in Sydney, but it certainly is in Melbourne, who become very um, suspicious of anything that comes out of the politician's mouth. So they'll sort of, um, you know, and they fail to appreciate that the, the medical bodies that are making these decisions are truly independent and they're just advising the government and the government then becomes their mouthpiece. But unfortunately, because politicians do play politics and we have seen the politicization of COVID on scales that, you know, on, on huge scales all across the world, um, not just in America and places like that, but also here in Australia. So unfortunately, that casts doubt and throws cold water on what we hear from the government. So I think that you're right in the sense that we need to try and uh, galvanize and to cement the reality that we're not living in some sort of um, you know, um, autocratic regime. We are living in a, in a democracy. And yes, governments and politicians will play games on some areas, but not when it comes to fundamental health issues. Um, and I think we not, need to drill that into the community's mind that the health advice is that it is professional health advice it's not politically motivated um so i think that's one of the other challenges that at least exists here in melbourne in a broader sense but not at st kilda Shul, dare i say it well that's very reassuring i think you're so right and it's such an important point i'll uh, unless there's a, a final question um which people can indicate and then uh, ezra can arrange the unmuting uh, but unless there's a, a final question i just want to um, um conclude by thanking Rabbi Glassman very much uh, for uh, taking his time and having this uh, this conversation uh, and wishing him and St Kilda and the whole Mel Melbourne community uh, all the best for a swift end to their lockdown and return to uh, normal and safe and healthy conditions. Um, I uh, happen to see a little video of a, of a Catholic priest, a young Catholic priest who seems to get very large viewer viewing figures for his uh, Facebook uh, recordings of his sermons. And uh, I saw uh, the sermon he gave, or part of it, when he went to a new parish and dressing his, uh, his congregation for the first time. And he said, at the end of his uh, remarks, said, and I'll be praying for you every day. And, uh, and I think we don't, in the Jewish community, in the rabbinate, uh, talk in those terms as much as we might. Uh, but I think as well as the vital necessity of calling people and um, uh, checking in personally, I think um, as rabbis, I think one of our jobs is to pray for our congregants. So Rabbi Glasson, we'll pray for you and you'll pray for us. And please, God, uh, we'll make our way through. From your mouth to God's ears. Thank you so much, Rabbi Elton, for the opportunity. Thanks. Be well. All the best.